6. You can find it on page 27 of your pew Bible, but I will be reading from the New International Version. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat, and I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or needing clothes, or sick or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, for the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. When someone does something nice to you, what do you say? Yeah. Sometimes we might give them a thank you card. Thank you. <laughs> Another way you can say thank you when someone does something really nice for you is by doing something nice for them back. Jesus, tell, uh, <laughs> Jesus tells us how we can say thank you to God for all he has done for us. Jesus said, whatever you do for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you do it for me. That means when we feed someone who is hungry, it is the same as doing it for Jesus. When we help someone, it is the same as doing it for Jesus. When we give clothes to those who are in need, it is the same as doing it for Jesus. We can say thank you to God by helping others. Let's remember to say thank you to God for all he does for us by reaching out to help others. Let us pray. Dear God, there is no thank you card that is big enough. to thank you for all you do for us. But we know that we can thank you by helping others. Help us to be helpers to others and to show your love. Amen. Hey, how's everyone doing today? <laughs> All right, my name is Matthew Winters, and I am a graduated senior now from Greensboro College Middle College and a senior at this church as well. So in preparation for my sermon today, my dad and I went through several of my grandfather's old sermons, and in one of them we came across a story. 
It was about two men hiking in the wilderness, and they were outside, and it was frigid and cold because there was a terrible blizzard outside. The two men were fearing for their lives, so they decided to go back and head for warmth. On their way back, they came across another man lying in the snow, and this man was half frozen and close to death. One of the men who was hiking before decided to leave the man in the snow because he was concerned about his own life and wanted to preserve it and wanted to get to warm as fast as he could. The other man saw the man and had compassion for him and decided to pick him up and with great difficulty carried him through the blizzard. A little farther down on their walk, the man who was carrying the other man came across a previous man and this time he was the one who was frozen and lying dead in the snow. The two other men had found that their combined warmth was enough warmth for them to stay alive throughout the snowstorm and the blizzard, and enough to keep them alive. What seemed as a hindrance to self-preservation actually ended up saving his life. I'm reminded of a verse in Matthew that goes, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it, and of another verse in Philippians that says, let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. The two men survived the blizzard because the one man decided to do something that the world saw as fatal. He risked his own life to save another's, and thus he lived. He put interest of another person in front of his own, and thus he found life. This idea of self-preservation and helping others being interdependent reminds me of another image as well. An image of us, God's people, being pillars for each other. We are built up in Christ, and when one pillar starts to fall, if another pillar starts to lean toward it, they can uh, catch each other's weight and hold each other up. It's just like dominoes. If one domino falls towards another domino and the one domino is straight up, then both dominoes will fall. But if they fall towards each other, then they will help each other up. Same would go for these pillars. We all have hard times and challenges and difficult things to power through. These challenges can range from depression, anxiety, an illness, a traumatic event, or whatever troubles us. When helping others, I have found that I've had all my challenges for a reason. And whatever challenges they were, they were there to strengthen me, and I recognized that they were there. What I decide to do with the bad is to find others who are struggling with the same and let them know that they are not alone. I open up and I show them what I'm dealing with. And I don't pretend to be perfect or that I have a perfect life. I feel like if I did, I really wouldn't be able to help anybody. The pillars have to lean, and as they both fall, they catch each other. Let's say I'm trying to learn a new instrument, and just because I like the name, it's the didgeridoo. <laughs> I would feel a whole lot more comfortable going to someone who already knows how to play the didgeridoo and learning from their experience than I would going to someone who has no idea what a didgeridoo even is. And I would also like to learn along someone who's at the same place that I am, and we can walk the path of the didgeridoo together. Which, by the way, if anyone wants to start a didgeridoo band, I would not be opposed. My ears might be if I'm in it, but... You don't have to be perfect in order to help someone. I believe the more troubled and flawed we seem, the better suited we are to help others. As people with life experiences and difficulties, someone that we can relate to. What happens when we are on the other side of this, though, when we're the ones that we see falling or failing, I believe that God grants us these pillars to which we can lean on. And sometimes it's hard to see God in these hard and troubled times, but he is always there as a mighty fortress for us to lean towards. But in times when it's harder to see that mighty fortress, God gives us these pillars. And what does that really mean? What kind of pillars? Well, these pillars can range from people that we confide in and talk to, that best friend, significant other, pastor, teacher, or any other title that we assign these people that mean the most to us, those that we are comfortable with. These are the people who listen to you when you're down or give you advice that you take, or who just cry when you cry or laugh when you laugh. People you're comfortable with and letting them know your true self. The people you run to when you have news or just to talk about life. These pillars can also be a hobby, and I know that I have found myself in music. I remember one day when I was feeling very down and just playing guitar until things got better. In that bad state of mind, it was harder to see God, but God gave me the ability and opportunity to play guitar, which I was grateful for and helped me through many hard times. I feel his presence in music, since he gave me music to be present in. 
These hobbies are a way for us to lean on something. They can be a sport, an instrument, sewing or knitting, going to lunch, going to a movie, going out with friends, or whatever feels like an expression of yourself and that you see God in, an activity or idea to lean upon. Something that God has provided in your life which you find and feel comforted by. Recognize that God has given the opportunity for such moments and shine in those. Even if it doesn't feel like much, if you feel God's presence in it, then it truly means a lot. God has given these things for us to lean on, and we too should be a safe haven for others. The idea of pillars leaning on each other and bearing each other's weight in order to stand reminds me of several verses as well. Galatians 6 2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Romans 15 1 says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. So this isn't just a physics thing of dominoes and pillars leaning on each other, but also the law of God, bearing each other's weight, being there for each other, leaning on each other in order to stand. We should do good because of the goodness shown to us by our Lord and Savior. And doing good doesn't have to be grand or flashy. It can be anything from saving a life, as in the first story, or just calling the check up on a friend. While it doesn't have to be grand or flashy, I do believe that it should be great. Barring from another sermon of the Reverend Matthew Winters is one of Abraham Lincoln. He attended a Wednesday night service along with one of his aides, and the sermon was by a pastor by the name of Dr. Gurley. Aide's aide asked him what the president thought of the sermon, to which honest aide replied, I thought it was well thought through. It was powerfully delivered and very eloquent. Then the aide asked if he thought the sermon was great, to which Abe replied, no, it failed. It failed because Dr. Gurley did not ask us to do something great. So friends and family of God, I will not stand here today and ask you to do something grand, and I will not tell you to do something flashy. I will just tell you to go out and change a world. Do something great. Be a pillar. Help change lives because yours was so changed. And I often worry if I will ever have an impact on this world that we all share, and I find comfort and console in the idea of a single life being its own world. That's what I mean by changing a world, just making an impact on one person. Show Christ to those that don't believe, not in a forceful or scary way, but in a way that shows the attributes of Christ. Loving, caring, forgiving, firm in values, protecting, understanding. Today I ask you to do something great. What may seem simple and small may leave an everlasting impact on someone's life. Do good. Share Christ. Go out into the world as caring and loving and Christ-like people, ready to help and to do good, no matter the cost and no matter the consequences. You may just find that what seemed to be a burden or a hindrance is the one thing that gave you life. And a sermon of my grandfather's, I'll close in this, as he left with his congregation so long ago in the year 1992, long before iPhones and YouTube. I cannot imagine. <laughs> I close this morning with your challenge, a prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubting, let me bring your faith. Where there is despair, let me bring your hope. Where there is darkness, your light. Where there is sadness, let me bring your joy. And grant that I may not be much seek to console, but to console. To be understood as to understand, not so much to be loved as to love another. For truly it is in giving that we now receive, and it is in parting that we are now pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born again. Amen.